Welcome everyone, firstly to today's session. So good day to you all and a very warm welcome to this webinar on the topic of achieving more effective outcomes in collective bargaining in this year, 2022. My name is Vanessa Boerter. I am the training manager at Conflict Dynamics and it is my pleasure to be hosting and facilitating today's discussions. This webinar arose out of an interview that I did recently with the General Secretary of the Transnet Bargaining Council, Ntumkulu Mashia. In the interview, Ntumkulu outlined a number of ways in which uh, he believes parties could get out of the collective bargaining rut, which they are currently in. This is a rut characterized by positional bargaining, protracted industrial action, and, and unfortunately frequent lose-lose outcomes to the bargaining process. And we only need to reflect on what happened when our president tried to address a Workers' Day rally at the Royal Buffer King Stadium in Rustenburg last week to know that the South African bargaining season is already facing dire circumstances. The ideas for improving our collective bargaining process and outcomes that came up in my interview with Ntumkulu, the General Secretary, were the following, basically. Firstly, in terms of trying to prevent disputes as a result of bargaining, the value of negotiation skills training prior to embarking on the bargaining process, as well as the value of uh, facilitation of a collective bargaining process by a neutral and a skilled third party. And secondly, in terms of avoiding or resolving protracted wage disputes, uh, the value of mediation, and in particular, the value of the concept of interest arbitration. And I'm happy to say that our four speakers today are uniquely positioned to comment on all of these ideas. So in a moment, I will be introducing you to our first speaker for the day. But before that, I'd just like to quickly give you a brief overview of the process which we'll be following for today's session. Firstly, um, I will be introducing each speaker before they speak. They will each speak for between probably around 10 and 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. And then I will uh, pose a question if relevant to uh, them before we move on to the next speaker, just to wrap up their thoughts. You, of course, as participants are welcome to submit comments or questions at any point during the webinar. This can be done via the chat button uh, at the bottom of your screen. The speakers and I will be keeping an eye on the chat and will address questions as far as time allows during the webinar. But if we find we have a lot of comments or questions which have not been dealt with at the conclusion of the webinar, our speakers have said that they will be happy to respond to those briefly via email afterwards. So please don't feel that your um, any burning questions or comments that you wish to make will be entirely lost if they haven't been raised by the time we conclude. Uh, please take note that we will be recording the webinar and we will make the recording available to you along with the accompanying slides that each presenter uses after the conclusion of today and you'll be receiving an email from us with those relevant details. So now without further ado, let me introduce you to our first speaker and we're going to begin today by hearing from Susan Hayter. Susan is a senior industrial relations specialist at the International Labour Office in Geneva, Switzerland, where she leads the team that produced the ILO's first flagship report on social dialogue entitled Collective Bargaining for an Inclusive, Sustainable and Resilient Recovery in the Governance and Tripartism, uh, sorry, tripartism Department. Uh, she's the editor and a contributing author of the role of collective bargaining in the global economy um, under ILO and Edward Elger, as well as industrial relations in emerging economies, also under ILO and, and Edward Elger, as well as a number of other publications. Her work focuses on the changing nature of work and production and the implications for unions, employers, and industrial relations generally. Prior to joining the ILO, 
Susan was the director of the Cape Town office of the Independent Mediation Service of South Africa, and she was a lecturer in industrial relations at the University of the Witwatersrand Business School. So Susan, we are very privileged to have you with us here today and we thank you very much for your time and your insights. And let me hand over to you. Just remember to unmute Susan. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share some of the insights from and the findings from the ILO's first uh, social dialogue report, which we launched last week. So if you like, it's, it's hot off the press. The report itself examines how collective bargaining contributes to inclusive, the inclusive and effective governance of work from the rights to to bargain collectively, the policies and institutions that promote collective bargaining, the process itself of voluntary negotiations, all the way to the collective agreement that is the result of those negotiations. I'm not going to take you through the entire report, so we have 10 to 15 minutes, um, but just really highlight some of the findings that are that are relevant to the subject today. So let me try and get through my my slides are not going. There we go. Right. So let me say something first about the coverage of collective agreements. Uh, being the proportion of workers or employees that are covered by a collective agreement that have their terms and conditions of employment set through collective negotiations before moving on to look at some of the outcomes. In the report, we estimate that uh, for 98 countries, over one third of employees have their pay and working conditions set through collective agreements. This ranges from over 75% in many parts you can see of uh, Europe and Uruguay to below or under 25% in half of the countries for which we have data. And if you look at South Africa, um, South Africa is somewhere around, around the average at 30.1% um, of employees being covered by a collective agreement. We find in the report that inclusive coverage is closely related to the institutional setting within which collective bargaining takes place. So while practices certainly differ widely across countries, if collective bargaining is taking place on an single employer basis only, an average 15.8% um, of employees and the total aid market would be covered by collective agreements, whereas where it takes place on a multi-employer basis, covering a sector or like in Brazil, a territorial area, an average of 71.7% .7 are covered. Now, South Africa with its bargaining councils, perhaps a kind of mixed um, bargaining councils and enterprise level um, comes in perhaps at that lower band of, of uh, sectoral, sectoral bargaining. Multi-employer arrangements like the bargaining councils in South Africa are not only likely to cover more workers, but they're also likely to produce more inclusive outcomes. They more likely to provide inclusive labor protection to vulnerable categories of workers such as migrant workers, workers in temporary or third party contracts, for example, through the use of extension mechanisms. They are also more likely to provide mechanisms that can contribute to universal social protection, be it sick pay, healthcare benefits, pensions, training funds and the like through the pooling of funds. And they're also likely to be more responsive, including through adaptability provisions such as um, exemptions for small businesses or temporary derogations and hardship clauses that can be invoked if circumstances change. Moving to the outcomes, the report itself examines the content of collective agreements um, through a review of 512 collective agreements and practices across 80 countries. We looked at nine recurrent themes in those collective agreements, wages and working time clearly being the sort of bread and butter issues, but then also OSH, social protection, 
terms of employment, training, work transitions involving both um, environmental transitions, but also technological transitions, and then equality, diversity and inclusion, and finally collective labor relations. I do not have time, obviously, in this presentation to go through it. I would invite you to, to look at the report. What I thought I would just do, since we're talking about effective and inclusive outcomes, is perhaps point to four important ways in which collective bargaining can make an important contribution to um, inclusive and effective outcomes. The first of those is by reducing inequality. Many of the agreements um, that we looked at address the wage distribution, for example, by providing higher increases for low wage workers achieved in some countries through a distribution option in Austria um, and, and a few other countries, or um, providing for staggered increases with higher increases for low wage workers, or in South Africa, for example, and across the board, either monetary or percentage wage increase, whichever is greater. Well over half of the agreements reviewed also reflected a joint commitment by employers and trade unions to address gender equality by addressing the gender pay gap um, in some countries reflecting on the undervaluation of traditional female dominated occupations and we see this a lot in healthcare and social care, ensuring equal pay for equal value and affording parental leave or working time arrangements that allow for better balance between family and um, family responsibilities and work, or I should say work and family responsibilities. And finally, by addressing and eliminating gender-based violence at work. Almost two thirds of the agreements reviewed included clauses fostering diversity and inclusion and eliminating discrimination. And there are many examples in the report. Much of that was context specific, depending on, on the form of discrimination that was prevalent in a particular um, country. The second way, the second finding in terms of the way that collective agreements can contribute to effective outcomes is, was through the tailoring of joint rules to particular industry, enterprise and workers needs and responding to particular issues. We, we certainly found that collective bargaining was allowing for what uh, we have called um, in South Africa for, for some time regulated flexibility, for example, in respect of linking pay or a variable component of pay to performance and productivity. Uh, three ways of doing that, either results-based, output-based, performance or productivity linked pay, or finally, uh, financial participation. 44% um, of the agreements that we looked at um, or examined had a variable component of pay that was linked to performance. In Europe, um, they tended to be more variable types of pay in industries where there were multi-employer or sectoral bargaining arrangements, which set a framework for subsequent implementation of that variable pay at the enterprise level. The second, I would say, flexible, uh, regulated flexibility or tailoring that we saw, and in which we saw a lot of innovation, was around uh, innovative, um, flexible working time arrangements. 53% of the agreements that we were looking at um, included these arrangements, either by um, providing employers with greater flexibility, employ um, employees with um, greater um, um, stability in terms of knowing, for example, in on-call work, when they were going to be on call regulating um, shifts, but also providing more autonomy. And the third area I would say where there was a lot of tailoring that we observed was in flexible work organization, including the introduction of technology where over one third of the agreements reviewed referred to solutions in respect of adopting new forms of technology um, into the workplace. The third uh, way in which collective agreements were contributing to effective outcomes was by providing skills development frameworks, encouraging and facilitating the retention of skills. Almost two thirds of the agreements we were reviewing provided frameworks for skills development, including upskilling, reskilling, skills recognition, and facilitating the integration of apprentices into the workforce, retaining firm, retaining firm specific skills. And, and one of the case studies that we draw on is in fact um, from South Africa. And the fourth way I would say that collective bargaining um, is 
contributing to effective outcomes is by contributing to sound industrial relations. A majority, 78% of the agreements we reviewed facilitate sound and stable industrial relations by agreeing to joint rules of conduct for collective labor relations, all the way from peace clauses, dispute resolution, um, procedures to trade union access and security and that was something certainly that employers um, that we interviewed um, said that they found very valuable in the in the agreements the report then goes on to look at what role did collective bargaining play during the pandemic in providing resilience so really this was a period 2020 and 2020 one in which collective bargaining was really put to the test. How adaptable was it? How effective was it in terms of the outcomes? And just two important points to make here. In countries which um, where collective bargaining was already a tradition, um, the responsiveness, there was a high degree of responsiveness in terms of the way in which employers and their organizations and trade unions adapted collective bargaining procedures and processes. In many instances, the renewal of collective agreements were postponed with parties either prolonging their the applicability of their existing agreements or negotiating rollovers um, in Canada or bridge agreements in Uruguay or agreements of a sh shorter duration to, to fill a gap in which there was a high degree of um, uncertainty. Many collective agreements switched online in some countries that necessitated adaptions in procedures to facilitate that in many that took place without any adaptions to the procedures. Um, the second point to make, I think, is how the focus of the bargaining agenda shifted away from perhaps the, the bread and butter issues, although they, they came into it, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but really looking at how to meet immediate concerns are related to the pandemic. OSH was the number one um, concern across the board, both for frontline workers who were most exposed to the virus and in close contact with other people, but also for businesses, particularly as lockdowns ended, how to ensure that those businesses could keep operating by ensuring um, safe, safe workplaces. Collective agreements in healthcare, social care, education, food retail, transport and, and uh, meat, meat preparation and meat packing included clauses ensuring adequate provision of PPE and and protocol uh, for protocols for its use. In a number of important instances, those protections were extended to temporary or contract workers, which would not otherwise have had those protections. Um, we saw also in Argentina, for example, the conversion of contracts temporary. Lots of workers in healthcare and social care were on temporary contracts. The conversion of those contracts to permanent contracts, not only so that they could be protected, enjoy the occupational safety and health um, protections, but also the sick sickness um, and and disability and um, and other you know, life insurances. In sectors other than key or critical services, collective agreements often serve to tailor uh, public health measures to the enterprise and strengthen the joint oversight of occupational safety and health at the workplace. And that kept those businesses um, operating and, and protected millions of workers. The second key issue was paid sick leave and healthcare benefits. And we saw that in 71% of the agreements we reviewed. We also saw it as an area in which there was a lot of negotiation, either to extend or amend existing provisions to um, include family members. And I think we haven't until the pandemic hit, perhaps these first two issues, we just hadn't appreciated how much um, those were, if you like, effective outcomes in terms of providing protection and and um, allowing the state perhaps to, to concentrate its resources elsewhere. Um, the third issue, the third and the fourth issues, working time and employment security often kind of came together, um, both aimed at saving employment, um, protecting earnest earnings and ensuring continue the continuity of businesses. In many countries, collective bargaining played a role in implementing government-sponsored um, employment retention measures, including short-time work, partial unemployment, wage subsidies, furlough schemes, and the like. But there were also instances in countries either that didn't have um, those funds or that had those funds where, where there was a real attempt to negotiate what we call short order flexibility in wage setting, moderating wages, 
um, shortening working time and perhaps changing work allocation in exchange for employment guarantees. One of the takeaways um, from, the, from the crisis, I would say, is the way in which collective bargaining helped to mitigate the potential effect of the crisis on inequality. We saw um, in many instances a topping up of the government um, employment um, retention schemes where, where particularly for low wage workers that income was too low. A high degree of solidarity in some enterprises and sectors focusing on temporary and agency workers in, for example, the Republic of Korea or in France, low wage workers where we saw um, managers donating the equivalent of their leave to a solidarity fund, which was then used to um, to um, provide income to, to low wage workers, which were falling below a threshold. In a number of instances, collective bargaining agreements also strengthened existing provisions or included new provisions to balance work and additional care responsibilities, mostly carried out by women due to school closures or care for ill members of the family. And we know that, um, that the, the, the Certainly the economic and the pandemic had a huge hit on, on, on women in labor markets. So just finally, I think there's, there's clearly much that can be done to take advantage of collective bargaining's contribution to the inclusive and effective governance of work. And I don't want to pay, paint too rosy a picture, but merely to describe what was possible. These solutions emerged despite deep contestation in many instances between parties, varying degrees of trust and collective disputes, strikes and, and other forms of collective action. Four important features stand out as key to promoting integrative bargaining outcomes. The first is the importance not only of strong and representative parties, trade unions and employers organizations, but also the the importance of negotiation skills, not only as a once-off training, but as a process of ongoing learning so that lessons that, that um, are learned from each round can be integrated and firmly embedded into future processes of collective bargaining. And of course, training and expertise to tackle new issues and, and particularly technology and environmental transitions, I would put as, as some of those issues. The second is the importance of information sharing and transparency, I would add, on the one hand, but the availability of credible information, such as productivity, um, industry norms, and, and uh, CPI. The third is the availability of facilitation and dispute resolution, and I know we'll talk about this, but you know, in, in some of the more innovative agreements that we saw, certainly facilitation played a, a key role, and it is playing a key role in Europe at the moment in um, shaping the kind of hybrid teleworking practices that, that we're seeing coming out, the, the collective bargaining agreements, at least, that are governing those. And the fourth issue is the importance of social dialogue at other levels, including tripartite social dialogue on labor law reforms, on the design of codes of practice or during the pandemic agreements to how the emergency um, emergency measures various emergency measures would be implemented through collective bargaining so let me say thank you i encourage you to read the report it has hopefully something in it for everybody i would say that lawyers would probably find chapters one and two interesting and the rest of us <laughs> chapters three four and five um, so i encourage you to have a look at it um, um, the ilo is available to provide technical assistance uh, through our office in pretoria thank you very much Thank you so much, Susan, for that uh, brief but extremely valuable insight into the report. Very much appreciated. Um, just by way of, of, of wrapping up on what you have uh, contributed here today, I know you've just mentioned what you believe are the four main things that have come through of, of value uh, from the report, broadly speaking. But I'm wondering if there's uh, perhaps just overall one issue um, or one finding emerging from the report that you feel would be the most relevant to our South African context at the moment and, and the rut that I spoke of earlier that we seem to be in with regard to bargaining. Any thoughts on that? Um, I th uh, yeah, I think the, the, the importance of having 
the availability of information is absolutely key and everybody having the same information so that needs a so i'm going to give you more than one because i think they just mm, they just yeah, are more than absolutely. one <laughs> the second i would say is facilitation services and um um, obviously, collective bargaining is a voluntary negotiation process, et cetera, et cetera. But I think facilitation is absolutely key. Um, and I would say the third thing is to appreciate that collective bargaining is an adaptable and responsive process. And without it, um, we need to rely on statutory forms of regulation, which in respect of compliance might not might imply you know, um, various costs, inspection, labor administration. Um, and so it's really worth actually investing in collective bargaining and the institutions that support it. Excellent. Thanks so much, Susan. And um, uh, as you mentioned, and, and I did mention earlier, we are uh, fortunately going to be interrogating a few of those critical issues that you've mentioned further, as we um, hear from the other speakers on our panel today. So thank you so much, much appreciated. All right, um, before we continue with our second speaker, we thought we would just put a quick question or two up on the screen for you to respond to. We'd love to hear from those that are in our um, audience, so to speak today. So Craig in the background, I wonder if you could just uh, put up our poll, right? There we go, two questions. Firstly, as to whether you um, personally, in your capacity, in whatever capacity that is in the bargaining process, are you aware of the code of good practice for collective bargaining that we have in existence in the country? Um, we'll leave you to very quickly record your responses there, choose your option. And then secondly, if you are aware of it, have you used the code of good practice? So let's give you all a, a, a half a minute or so just to record your responses there. Craig, of course, when uh, we have uh, a, a sufficient or, or all of our responses, if you'll just put up on screen what the results of this poll are. Yeah, we're just giving it a few more seconds. Last few people, give the last few people a chance to record their thoughts. We just thought it would be interesting, given that um, our next speaker will be speaking to this topic as to see what people thought. Right, so there we go, thank you. Right, so to the question, are you aware of the code of good practice for collective bargaining? We have, um, 33% of our respondents, 11 of 33 respondents who say indeed, yes, they know about the code, they're familiar with its contents. And a very similar figure, slightly more, but very similar in essence, uh, say yes, we've heard about the code, but actually we don't know what it says. So we know it's out there, but um, we, we, we're not sure what it provides for. And a fairly significant, similar amount, but significant um, number have not heard of our code of good practice. And um, for those who have used, uh, sorry, or are familiar with the code of good practice in terms of how many have used the code to inform their approach to collective bargaining, we have 21%, seven people have said yes. And a much larger percentage have said no, 79% of respondents have said no. So clearly um, it's uh, not a document which a lot of people, or at least not the majority of people in the employment relations sphere are very familiar with um, and indeed are using, or it seems not many people are using it. And, it really is, um, we believe, an important, a very, very important guideline and um, um, 
you know, guidance to parties who are engaging in a collective bargaining process. And with that in mind, I'm going to introduce our second speaker who will speak briefly to the Code of Good Practice and some of its extremely important provisions and how those can be put to best use in terms of um, uh, bringing about more effective collective bargaining in our country. So let me introduce to you William Thompson, who is a practicing attorney and a commercial and civil mediator, accredited by both Conflict Dynamics and the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution in the UK as well. He's a former director of the Independent Mediation Service of South Africa, and he's currently a senior CCMA commissioner and a panelist for various public and private sector bargaining councils and accredited private dispute resolution agencies. William teaches courses on negotiation, mediation, and labor dispute resolution at a large number of South African universities and he facilitates training and other processes for the ILO as well. He's accredited as a coach through the UCT Graduate School of Business, as well as internationally. And finally, he's also a research associate in the law faculty at the University of Cape Town. So William, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you briefly. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And uh, just up front, thanks for also just uh, popping up some slides there as well. Um, I thought, I'm just looking at the time here, we're going to keep it brief. And uh, I've, I've broken it into really four parts to have a look at here. First of all, just to begin with the end in mind, I'll tell you what that is, to have a little bit of a look at the authority for uh, um, the collective bargaining um, processes in South Africa, to look a little bit at the context and then to, I'm going to speak specifically into the area of the training. And uh, from that first slide that we can just see up there is collective bargaining in terms of the Labor Relations Act and also the Code of Good Practice. And uh, Vanessa, thank you and to Craig for that poll there. I just jotted up the numbers. 33% um, saying they knew about the code. 36% um, said that saying that they'd heard about it, but weren't so sure about the details. 30 saying they hadn't. And then when it came down to those who were using the code, even of those 33%, the third, 21% um, of the people saying we've actually used it. And so if I was to begin with the end in mind, um, I, my question, what I'm saying here is the question that's often been mulled around and discussed is in South Africa with some of the best and most enabling legislation in the world, um, especially around labor relations um, and the and collective bargaining, how come we have um, the kind of very adversarial, very positional type collective bargaining in our country? And I'm going to just say two big ones that stand right out for us at the moment is, is we've got the public sector negotiations happening at the moment, collective bargaining. We've got the Sabanya, um, um, you know, negotiations happening as well. And those are just two uh, particular industry sectors that are looking at there. Then when I come to authority, just taking the um, Constitution and having a look at Section 23 there, the Labor Relations Right, and specifically uh, Section 23, um, Subsection 5, Every trade union, employer's organization, um, and employer has the right to engage in collective bargaining. So we take it from there. And the next one that I want to go to is to our Labor Relations Act itself. And just behind me on the flip chart, I've drawn a picture of our Labor Relations Act of 1995, and I've put four legs to the table there. Um, and if we go to the purpose of our Labor Relations Act, the four legs depict the purpose of the Act. And the purpose of the Act is in a country with extreme inequality, you know, often been said to be the most unequal country in the world, um, extreme poverty, extremely high unemployment, and very low economic growth and economic development, which really also talks to perhaps a not very creative, problem solved needs-based, interest-based approach to engaging in workplace. But when one understands that context, and then we look at our Labor Relations Act and we say, well, the very purpose of the Act is to advance economic development. It's to advance social justice. It's to advance labor peace and to advance democratization of the workplace. And then if I look just a little bit further down is that what, thank you, Vanessa, just what we popped up on the slide there is 
within that section and the purpose, section one, specifically D there, speaks about the promotion of orderly collective bargaining, um, bargaining at a sectoral level, bargaining councils and others, and very specifically, employee participation in decision making in the workplace. And we'll just hold it there, Vanessa, before we go to the next slide. But employee participation in the workplace in decision making, as well as the effective labor relations disputes, one of the key legs of the Labor Relations Act itself. Um, Vanessa, if, and perhaps just before we go to the next slide, is that maybe during our, our questions and discussion a little bit later, is we might speak a little bit broader than just the code of good practice and training and capacity building, and also go into areas of relationship building. Um, and also, as our very esteemed one of our colleagues, uh, Clive Thompson, a former professor of the Labor, Relation, Labor Law Unit at UCT, now based in Sydney, um, wrote a wonderful chapter um, in, in a book um, where he entitles, um, in fact, um, cooperation in the workplace and speaks about the South African flag um, never unfurled, speaking about the, the purpose of workplace forums and others there too. So maybe we can hold that a little bit for a little bit later in the discussions there. Vanessa, let's have a look at the next slide there. There's a photograph that was taken um, in 2014. If I just look a little bit before that, in 2011, um, the CCMA held a 15 year think tank um, in um, Gallagher State in Midrand. And three key things that came out from that think tank was that labor relations had deteriorated to become very positional, very adversarial in South Africa, not very creative, not very innovative. Um, also that negotiation styles had also become very, very positional. And lastly, also that um, organizations, statutory dispute resolution organizations like the CCMA and bargaining councils and other accredited agencies being very effective in dispute resolution, but looking also at dispute prevention, which would be the capacity building and the facilitation and coaching of processes uh, to have a look at that. And that was a photograph um, at a conference in Ikurileni in 2014. Um, in fact, in November 2014, that's on the left hand side. Uh, he was deputy president of the Republic of South Africa, Soro and Pausa uh, at the time. Uh, he called an urgent NEDLAC summit. In the middle there on the stage is Alistair Smith, who was director of NEDLAC at the time, and on his right there, uh, former Minister of Labour, as it was known before Minister um, uh, Tullis and Clazy of Employment and Labour, but former Minister Mildred Oliphant. And this was a conference that was held to look not just at South Africa's minimum wage, which was part of it, but also to have a look at uh, the state of collective bargaining in South Africa. And having said that, um, what we what i'm holding up just to the camera at the moment is we're going to have a very brief and quick look before i hand over to my colleague mohammed raja who's going to be speaking specifically about facilitation and collective bargaining is that out of that summit came the code of good practice on collective bargaining industrial action and picketing the one that we've just done a quick poll on vanessa if we could pop, pop the next slide on if I have a look at the code of good practice and I take the authority of the Constitution, I take the authority and also in our Labor Relations Act, uh, where part of the purpose is to give effect to the obligations incurred by the Republic as a member of the International Labor Organization that Susan's been speaking about, and then our commitment within the Constitution as well. And so coming back to that initial question, if we have some of the most enabling framework, um, the most um, the systems, the processes, how come our labor relations is, is, is very often so adversarial in the way it is? And in our training, we often speak about three Ps. We speak about the people, the process, and the problem. And the process is, is very often codified into terms of reference for uh, bargaining forums. It's even contained within the code of good practice. Problem solving is something that can be assisted through facilitation but that people, that mistrust issue. And that's where just in reflecting as we prepared yesterday and also uh, just before this morning too, of thinking of the real value of joint union management training on the code of good practice, uh, where we have experienced very often union officials, shop stewards, managers and others during the very training process, um, having discussions with each other, playing different roles with each other, 
planning very strategically for collective bargaining processes during the training, looking at each other's needs and interests, um, looking at each other's alternatives to various negotia uh, negotiated settlements and others. And there's a lot of kind of conversation and discussion and dialogue that often happens in that training before the parties go into a process where very often what they'll do is they'll choose a facilitator to assist with the facilitation of that process. And Mohammed will be speaking about his experiences in facilitating the process and to use the term a conflict coach of the training doesn't stop with the maybe two day, one day, two day, three day training. It continues right through the process where the conflict coach comes in there. All I'd like to say just in my last few minutes, um, Vanessa, just before I close, is that in the code of good practice, we'll just stay on that slide for a moment, is that we look at that. It was uh, gazetted on the 12th of December 2018. I remember facilitating a collective bargaining process with a very large employer in Johannesburg. There were four trade unions on the eve of this being gazetted. And we spoke to the bargaining forum who decided they wanted to work as a coalition of trade unions. They decided to draft um, some terms of reference for the bargaining process. And they decided to adopt this code of good practice um, in going into those negotiations. And what helped hugely during those processes, that process, which eventually concluded a three year uh, collective bargaining agreement. What was interesting was that there was even a clause in there that should CPI or inflation or something else change in the third year that the parties could come back to relook at that. And that is in fact what actually happened three years later too. But it was by agreeing to a process in terms of the terms of reference as well as what was contained in the code of good practice and adopting the code of good practice and then the facilitation of the process that um, the facilitators that were able to assist the parties where often they would get stuck um, in trust issues, positional issues, maybe even ego issues from time to time, or various other agenda issues that were there. And what I'd just like to say is we've got the code of good practice. It's broken down into four sections. Um, it's not on the screen there, but for those who have perhaps heard about but haven't looked, First part is part A is an introduction. Second part is on collective bargaining. And then there's a part on workplace democracy and dialogue. There's a part on industrial action strikes and lockouts. And lastly, there's a section on picketing. All we're gonna to touch on really in the last two or three minutes here, but we can take some questions in question time here, is the part B which deals with the um, what the purpose is <clears throat> and specifically on, on, on collective bargaining. And if we have a look there, the purpose on the screen there is to strengthen and promote orderly collective bargaining by promoting trust, mutual understanding and constructive engagement right out of our Labor Relations Act and the maximum involvement of workers and worker representatives in negotiations. Vanessa, if we could just have a look at the next slide, which I think is our last, it's our second last slide, is that in the code, um, it speaks to, these are the key themes in the code, the principles of good faith bargaining, which come very much out of what Susan was speaking about, the ILO conventions and recommendations and international best practice on good faith bargaining, speaks very much what Susan spoke earlier about, about the development and support for negotiators, and it actually encourages joint union management training, or if it's going to be separate training, that the parties do the same kind of accredited, recognized, respected training courses that cover thoroughly the code of good practice and understanding there too. Just a quick one in that is that training of parties individually works well. It definitely works even better when the parties are about to go into negotiations with each other. They know that it's going to happen within a few weeks or a few months, and they've come together as union negotiators and as employer negotiators. And within those maybe two days, one day, two days, or maybe three days of actual training, role playing and coaching there. And then the party is saying afterwards, we would also like to maybe have somebody facilitate the process for that to continue. That's, that's the first part. It speaks very much about the training and capacity building. The code goes into how to prepare for negotiations, it sets out the stages, and then it speaks of the second or the third point that, that um, Susan spoke about, 
is the, um, Susan spoke about the training, which was the development and support. Susan spoke about the disclosure of information, which is the second last point on the screen there, sharing information, disclosing information. And Susan spoke about productivity, CPI, industry, and all sorts of other very, very relevant factors there to make informed decisions. And then Susan also spoke about the use of facilitators, which Mohammed's going to speak about a little bit more. And that's all contained in the code. And then the last point that I've just put there is this good faith declaration. Because within the code, it's actually on page 38 of the code, it's two pages, and it gives the parties an opportunity to even commit to each other and to say, we commit to this code as well. And, and I and, and facilitate my co-facilitator in these particular negotiations have found it very useful when parties got stuck in the process to come back to that commitment and come back to those principles. Vanessa, I think there's one last slide there. Let's just have a quick look at that. No, that is the end. So in fact, that is very helpful as well. So Vanessa, I think also I'm going to stop on that note there and um, let you um, take over from here. And then we could handle other questions um, or discussions later. Right. Thanks so much, uh, William. That's really, really um, insightful and useful, I think. Um, maybe just one thing that stands out for me, you, you mentioned particularly, you referred particularly to the concept of joint union and management training. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, training each of the parties individually certainly has its value, but that there is particular value in a joint training approach. Maybe just a very quick thought from you um, further as to what the, the, you know, in your practical experience, have you seen any particular benefits of that joint approach to training? Vanessa, thank you, and I will keep it very brief um, because I have seen the different ones, perhaps where we have a public course and we have a number of people from different organizations, and there's a benefit to people experiencing other people's environments and some of the challenges that they go through and practicing maybe with, with them as well. Then there's the one where we might run it entirely for a management group or entirely for a union group, and then the third group, as you've mentioned here, and where there have been a number of situations where people are saying we're about to commence our collective bargaining in a few weeks time we've identified that we would like to actually do some training before we go into that and i can really say that in my own personal experience is that when the parties come together there's kind of to go back to those words an end in mind the parties can visualize that they're going to be doing that and there's a kind of an appetite and a thirst and and very often when we we swap around and sometimes the union people play the managers and the managers play the union people learning the same principles of preparing for presenting in, we use a lot of the interpersonal skills of the asking what type of questions, the listening, the paraphrasing, the reframing. And um, so there is certainly a major, major advantage to parties who are about to do their own collective bargaining and who come on the training. And then very often they say, we would like to have a facilitator to facilitate. And for me, the training hasn't stopped. It's just a different version of training that happens through the, um, what our other wonderful colleague Felicity Stedman often refers to as conflict coaching as well. Excellent, thanks William. And, and um, I think that's an incredibly useful segue into um, hearing from Mohammed next, our next speaker. And just that concept of the flow from um, effective training around the collective bargaining skills required by both parties, that joint training, and then the flow into a facilitated process going forward after that. So let me then, thank you. Thank you again, William, for your yeah. input. So let me then introduce to you our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Mohammed Raja. Um, Mohammed is a commercial mediator, accredited by the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution in the UK. He was an associate professor at the UNISA Graduate School of Business Leadership, lecturing in labor law, negotiation, and conflict management, industrial relations, and dispute resolution. And, and this was for a lengthy period from 1980 to around 2016. He has extensive experience as a bargaining forum chairperson, as a facilitator, a mediator, an arbitrator, a trainer, and a relationship building facilitator. 
and I can attest to the fact that he does um, excellent facilitation work for us uh, through Conflict Dynamics. Mohammed is a part-time senior commissioner at the CCMA and is also on the CCMA's collective bargaining panel. Um, he was a consultant trainer for the ILO and has also finally served as an editor for the South African Journal of Labor Relations and has published several articles and research reports. So on that note, Mohammed, let me hand over to you. Thank you so much. Remember to unmute, Mohammed. Yeah, that, that's become the buzzword. Please unmute. Okay, thanks for that introduction. And uh, good morning, or it's almost afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I've been asked to speak about facilitation of collective bargaining. Um, Vanessa, could you put the slides up for me, please? Sure, I will do that. Okay, so that, that is the, the topic, it is facilitation of collective bargaining and collective agreement. So if we could go to the next slide, for this, uh, Vanessa, please. Okay, the ILO report, of course, speaks of collective, and we heard Susan talking of that, of collective agreement contribute to fighting inequality, including narrow, narrowing gender and the wage gap. Now, I chose this particular point from the report because inequality sadly is still a burning issue and a major contributor to disputes in south africa and we see this often the slogans at pickets and i, and I saw one of the questions uh, in the chat and and i think it's from the uh, general secretary of the bargaining transat bargaining council the the, the strikes are often uh, very robust they often uh, damaging to the property. The, uh, it's not peaceful uh, demonstrations. And the slogans at Pickett's bear this out. Slogans such as, stop the exploitation, we want a living wage, uh, we continuously being uh, exploited, and this continues and this must stop and narrow the wage gap. And with this, as William indicated, a, a stunted economy which hinders job creation and earning capacity. So that contributes to this narrow to the wage gap. And it doesn't obviously contribute to narrowing of the wage gap. And the narrowing of the wage gap has been on the negotiating table forever. I mean, I've been in labor negotiations and facilitations for many, many years. And from the beginning, narrowing of the wage gap has always come up. It comes up at every negotiation, practically, where the unions will say, we need to narrow the wage gap. It's not happening. There's promises that it's going to be done, and it still hasn't been done. So it continues to be done. We know from experience that collective bargaining is robust, often aggressive, uh, in the way it is conducted is often adversarial, as William indicated. And if parties are left on their own, this could degenerate into disrupting the collective bargaining meeting. Vanessa, the next slide, please. Okay, the code of good practice uh, on collective bargaining and it's in and industrial action and picketing. The code of good practice has recognized the importance of facilitation in collective bargaining. As Susan indicated, the ILO report as well has recognized the importance of facilitation in collective bargaining. The code, and we see with the ILO report encouraging this, it states that parties should consider the appointment of facilitators, appointment of facilitators at any stage, ideally at the start, the, of the beginning of the negotiations. Facilitators are useful at all stages. And as Susan said, occupational health became an important issue now with COVID. And often we find that parties 
after they've reached agreement, they've gone away and they now come back to discuss health and occupational issues, they call the facilitator in to assist. So it's important, again, to show that facilitators play a big role, not only for bargaining councils at their main agreement, but also it's a continuous process whenever they have issues, instead of declaring disputes and going to the dispute uh, section of the bargaining council or to the CCMA, they call in the facilitator who assists. And the facilitator obviously has a dual role. It is a hybrid between facilitating and uh, mediation. So the code is clear on this. Appointment at any stage, preferably at the beginning. Facilitators continue to facilitate even after a dispute has been declared. And we see that often. Parties are on strike, they call the facilitator in to assist. And facilitators often play a big role at that stage as well. And they would obviously prefer to use the facilitator that assisted with their main agreement at the bargaining council, because that person is familiar with the issues, that person is familiar with the parties, the rapport has been established with the parties, and they feel comfortable with the facilitator coming in and assisting at that stage. Now, it could be, as the code says, one or a panel of facilitators. Co-facilitation is useful. Facilitation at times can be exhausting because these collective bargaining meetings continue sometimes, not hours, not days, but sometimes for weeks because people have a meeting for one or two days, they go away, get fresh mandates, uh, report back to their, uh, to their constituents and then come back. And it's often useful to have a co-mediator just to compare notes, to discuss, to have your own side caucus or side meeting, just like the parties have their side meetings and their side caucuses. Vanessa, the next slide, please. Okay, so facilitation, as I said, it's a hybrid. It, can, it usually includes mediation function as well. At the start of facilitation, I would usually ask the parties, Let's agree on terms of reference. And invariably, the parties would say, we would want you to mediate as well, which would include having private side meetings like normal mediations. So often the facilitation, and this is very often at the main agreements at bargaining councils, they will say, Mohammed, please, not only do we want you to chair the meeting, we want you to play an active role, we want you to mediate as well when necessary, and this often happens, and, and this is a big help for the parties because it avoids them then declaring disputes and going the dispute uh, procedure. The mediation function contributes to a facilitated agreement, disputes are minimized, facilitation assists in moving parties from an adversarial and positional bargaining to mutual gains bargaining and that's really so important and it keeps focus on issues because often the parties would sort of attack individuals they will become personal and the facilitator would obviously then using the sort of one-on-one skills uh, you know belong to the language rephrase bring parties back to focus on the issues and away from what they are busy with. Then I, I asked one of the parties, well, in fact, more than one of the parties, what they see as the benefits of facilitation in collective bargaining. And this was one of the major unions, the general secretary of one of the major unions. Uh, and one of the other person I asked is the uh, manager who's also a senior uh, bargaining uh, role player. And both of them indicated that it enables the parties to focus on the collective bargaining issues without muddling issues by advancing personal vendettas. It expedites the conclusion of the collective bargaining process. And of course, this is done through paraphrasing and laundering of language by the facilitator. The next slide, please, Vanessa. 
Okay, multi-term agreements often, and we heard William speaking about that, in, in, in two-year, three-year agreements, and often with the three-year agreements, and sometimes there is, and, and of course, so recently there has been one or two uh, deadlocks at the third stage because of COVID. The employer now cannot afford to pay what they had agreed on previously, and they want to come back and renegotiate the third term. And we were involved in those type of negotiations. And they call the facilitator in because the facilitator that was in from the beginning is familiar with the issues, is familiar with what was decided, and that person can adequately assist with dispute prevention. And very often we are involved in this multi-term uh, agreement. Other potential dispute tri triggers at bargaining councils are the group dynamics issues. Several management organizations on the one side, several union on the other side, and they often, although they put forward a united position, it becomes clear as the process unfolds that they not, do not speak with one voice. We're not surprised sometimes. We find a union and employer closer together than two unions or two employer organizations. And, and that is something that the facilitator has to manage as well. And of course, the skills that the facilitator uses is the sort of skills that we do at mediation, you know, laundering the language, focusing on the issues, uh, building a, a golden bridge so that the parties can get closer together and, and those type of things. And, and we've heard what uh, William said and we've about uh, the importance of training. And during the facilitation process, it's an opportunity, like we do at mediation, it's an opportunity to infect train parties without them realizing that you're training them. And I think I'll end on that note, uh, Vanessa. Thanks so much, Mohammed. Um, yeah, there certainly is, I know from my experience as well, much and much, much, much to be said about the value of a facilitator. Perhaps just a very quick question to finish off from your side. Um, any brief thoughts around the best way for parties to go about selecting a facilitator? or a panel. Or a panel. <laughs> Obviously difficult. I, I mean, I obviously say select me, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I look, uh, clearly you need to look at the person's background, you need to look at the experience, uh, uh, and, and that's really important. And somebody that can relate to both parties, and often the parties know that, I mean, the, those of us that have been in industrial relations in South Africa for many, many years, we already know the parties, the parties know us, so therefore it becomes easier for them to select because they've used facilitators before, they're comfortable with the facilitator. The facilitator knows what their issues are, knows their personalities, have established rapport with the parties. So that, that is the facilitator that they are going to use. And of course, neutrality is absolutely essential for facilitation. So they need to ensure that the facilitator is going to be a neutral person at all, all the time. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Really appreciate your input. Um, before we move on to our uh, fourth speaker of the day, we are just going to ask you a quick question once again on the screen. So Craig, if we could get our, our poll up, uh, that would be great. Thank you so much. So two quick questions again here. Firstly, has your organization, uh, whether that be on the employer side or a union, ever considered using, or in fact actually used arbitration to resolve an interest-based dispute, such as a wage and conditions of employment dispute? And secondly, if yes, if you have done so, um, are you currently designated as an essential service? Right, so um, again, let's just give our audience uh, a minute or so to log their responses to those questions. <clears throat> right, so the responses will be coming in. Just a few more seconds to allow more to 
have they say? And uh, we're asking these questions because this is the topic that we're going to be looking at next. Thanks, Craig. So we have had uh, 28 responses. And in terms of question one, has arbitration, have you ever used arbitration to resolve an interest-based dispute as opposed to rights disputes? And very interestingly, the majority of people who responded have indeed said, yes, we have. That's very encouraging to see. Um, and then if we move to question two, uh, we were wanting to get a context in terms of whether those responses are from essential service. So we have 39% of our respondents who say, yes, in fact, they are designated as an essential service and therefore, of course, would be um, involved in using arbitration for interest-based disputes. But we have 29% of respondents who are not forming a part of a designated essential service and yet still have said that um, they have used interest-based arbitration, uh, sorry, arbitration for interest-based dispute. And then we of course do have some who've said this is not applicable as they haven't considered using arbitration in such a case. Well, thank you to everyone who responded to that poll. And it um, takes us into my introducing our last speaker for today. Chris Albertain, and uh, we'd like to welcome Chris, who is an arbitrator and a mediator in Canada. He's a member of the National Academy of Arbitrators and of the Ontario Labor Management Arbitrators Association. He's on the Labor Minister's list of arbitrators kept by the Ont Ontario Office of Arbitration and by the Canadian Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. He's a mediator and arbitrator of the Ontario Grievance Settlement Board, also formerly a vice chair of that board, and a former vice chair of the Ontario Labour Relations Board. Um, Chris, of course, is originally from South Africa, and so in the past he was an active IMSA and CCMA arbitrator in South Africa in the 1980s, and he certainly has published widely on a wide, on a wide range of uh, labor relations matters. So Chris, welcome and thank you so much for being with us, especially very early in the morning from Canada. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. So um, I'm gonna talk about interest arbitration. So I think the first point is that interest arbitration is not a substitute for collective bargaining. It's a continuation of collective bargaining. And I think it's, it's important to see it less as a, it has a legal effect, obviously. There's a final outcome. There's an, a binding award at the end, but it's much less a legal process and a dispute resolution process that we're mostly familiar with in rights disputes. There's not a right and a wrong answer in it. There's not one party winning and the other party losing. It is as the best interest arbitration is a continuation of collective bargaining and the achievement of an outcome which is as consistent as possible as what the parties might themselves have come to. So I think if you ask the question, why interest arbitration? It comes right at the end. It doesn't replace any of the points that William and, um, and Susan and um, Muhammad were making about the use of facilitators, mediators, people to assist in the outcomes. It's at the point where there is no likelihood of an agreement, no real prospect. <clears throat> and the alternative is, do you strike or lock out with the consequences that go with that? Or do you choose a, a process that avoids that, but ideally 
achieves the the same outcome. So I think one of the, I mean, there are many, many things about Canadian labor relations that are faulty and need improvement and don't work terribly well and all sorts of issues that need to be addressed. But in one area, they do, they do something I think very well indeed, which is the interest arbitration uh, disputes. Large numbers of large industries, um, they use interest arbitration, partly because they're required to by law. I mean, police, fire, all the essential services, those use it, but many use it. Also, the other thing here is that they don't have a separation between emergency service and um, and then a small and then interest arbitration for for small group in strikes. It's either the whole the whole industry is covered by in, interest arbitration. So it means unions are not weakened by having to provide emergency services during a strike. The whole the whole so all of healthcare, for example, in nursing homes, retirement homes. Uh, hospitals, of course, all go to interest arbitration, any disputes there. And then others have chosen to go that route. So the energy sector, say the equivalent of ESCOM and the uh, providers of energy at all levels, those municipal as well as the, the actual energy providers, most of those by agreement go to interest arbitration. And then in the construction industry, they can strike for a certain period, but then at the end of that period, they must go to interest arbitration. So it's widely used. And I'm going to talk a bit about why I think it's particularly effective in this country. It's um, firstly, the fundamental principle of interest arbitration is replication. Replication means we try to replicate, as a board of arbitration, we try to replicate what the parties would themselves have done, basically, if they're acting sensibly. And the results show that over a long period of time, the outcomes are almost identical between interest arbitration and, uh, and collective bargaining. So if you look at freely negotiated collective agreements, outcomes and you look at the interest arbitration outcomes they are they're absolutely consistent over a long period of time that suggests people are not doing better or worse out of interest arbitration but they they're getting the same result they would have got if they got an agreement and that's the target that's the aim of of the process and its big advantage is of course that you don't suffer any loss as a result of the impasse. So instead of a strike where, say, the workers are losing 2% of their annual wages every week of the strike, avoidance of the disruption to the business, avoidance of the collateral damage if there's violence or disturbance associated with the strike. So that's a great appeal, particularly to unions in this country, of of being able to um, utilize the facility of an interest arbitration rather than to exercise the right to strike. Um, so how's it done? Essentially, it's done by a board of arbitration. It could be a single arbitrator or it could be a board. I personally prefer much prefer working with a board. A board is a three person or more, but typically three neutral arbitrator, one person appointed by the union, one person appointed by the management, by the employer. So the those two, they're known as nominees or sides people, the two nominees appoint the arbitrator typically, but they do it in consultation with their client, with the union and with the employer or employers. And the the key role, the most successful role in this process, I think, is the, are the nominees. The role they play is the role of trying to 
they work between the arbitrator with each other and with their client. So it's not like a normal case. I mean, in a rights case, if you're on a board of a, of a rights case, a board of adjudication, you don't discuss with the parties what you're going to do in the decision. But it's quite normal and expected that the nominees will work with the leaders of their organization. I mean, on a confidential basis, the information is what, what happens on the board is a confidential process, but the members of the board can speak to their, their, their the lead person in the union or management to explore possible ideas of reaching a settlement. So the process is mostly done as a MEDARB or in, I mean, I know in the Labor Relations Act, there's a provision for CONARB and, and they use it in Australia, CONARB, we call it MEDARB, but it's basically the merger of mediation and arbitration. So you can go from the one to the other at any points in the process. So it's pretty efficiently done. Um, once they've agreed to an arbitrator, once the two nominees have appointed an arbitrator, the arbitrator sets the date. And then before that date, um, the parties will provide a brief, not long before, typically it's the day before, it might be a few days before. You get a written brief from both sides. I could show you this if we had a bit of time, but they, and I can provide copies to Vanessa um, of what a, a brief would look like, but it essentially sets out all the issues and all the arguments and what facts they're relying on. And both sides file the briefs. Um, factual disputes are not resolved. I mean, if there's a bit of a factual dispute, you might ask the parties about it, but there's no evidence in the case. They arrive on the day of the hearing and the panel will have read the briefs. So we'll be familiar with uh, what the parties, what's at issue, what the parties are arguing, and we will then try and resolve the dispute on the basis of all the information we've got. We'll meet with, uh, I typically will meet with the two leading parties for the union and the management and the two nominees. So the five of us will meet and try and see what we can do to resolve it. Sometimes just the nominees meet with the parties themselves and try and work out an agreement without the arbitrator. Sometimes the nominees just spend time in each of their rooms and then come back to the main room with the arbitrator um, and try and work out the deal there. We do as much as we can to get an agreement on all the issues. We, we, we use the processes that, I mean, uh, that Muhammad was referring to of, of trying to understand what's really important. And I think that's the... The, the, the key role of these nominees is for them to not just be advocates. If somebody is just an advocate in your room, in the board of arbitration, that's of no value to you, to the arbitrator, because they're just repeating what the advocates did before. You want somebody who, who acts as a facilitator and mediator, who knows what's most important, say for the union or for management, and brings those and pushes those ideas and sees how those ideas can be included in the final decision. <clears throat> so it's very much a negotiated decision, the, um, the outcome. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, maybe the arbitrator's got to make a decision, but they, they will rely on the tenor of the discussions and the good nominees will make clear the things that really they need they need and they must get something on they will have participate in the drafting of language and so on um, <clears throat> and they will make reasonable concessions i mean they may say look we're, i'm not going to fight that to the end that one that's an indication to the arbitrator that we can i can not not grant that award Typically, the awards do not have many reasons. Parties don't like um, voluminous reasons. The reasons are very brief. It's really the result that they want. 
Interest arbitration is also useful sometimes in that if both parties, both parties often have difficulties. The employer side has got to report back to a board of directors. The union side has got to report back to the membership. They're making compromises beyond what both sides would like. So sometimes you can reach an agreement or very often it happens, actually, you reach an agreement with the parties in the interest arbitration. And that award is then issued by the arbitrator with partial concurrence or partial dissent by the nominees. They'll each say, I partially concur or I partially dissent means, means basically the same thing. Um, but the result is that the parties can then they can then report back to the parties, well, this is the award we got. This is what the arbitrator decided. And um, in some ways, it makes it possible for them to um, deal with their own difficulties in reducing the, um, the, the expectations of both sides. So anyway, I think it's a very successful process over here. It works well, and um, it's uh, and uh, I think it's something that should be considered as as an addition to the collective bargaining process. Thanks. Those I've got some other points, but I mean those are the essential things I wanted to say. Wonderful. Thanks, Chris. It's really, really useful to hear of the. Um, Canadian experience and particularly of the value obtained from uh, making use of interest arbitration to a great extent in that country. Maybe just by way of conclusion, and unfortunately our time is short, so just a very br uh, brief uh, uh, final point from you if possible. Any thoughts on how we could launch this process into South African collective bargaining at this point in time. Any thoughts on how to get this going in our context? You know, um, I think, I mean, uh, the, the nominees here who have done this work for a long time on the union and management side, who'd be very useful, I think, in explaining their role and what they do. I mean, I'm the beneficiary of it in the sense as the arbitrator by being able to you know, um, I push them and I say, well, what about this? What about that? Same as you try when you're facilitating. But it's, it's, it's a real skill of managing the client as well as helping the outcome, helping a reasonable and sensible outcome. I mean, if the, the nominees are key and you could choose anybody uh, to do it. I mean, you don't need to be a lawyer. You don't have people with, I mean, you could choose other experienced you know, on the union side, other experienced union people who who um, who have a lot of experience of collective bargaining, who could be the nominee for them, you know, and the same in management, similar. It's people who people who are good at bargaining and reaching agreements are the ideal people for nominees. Because I think the arbitrators the arbitrator has got to be sensible of actually listening carefully to the, to the nominees. If you don't have nominees, if you sit as a single arbitrator, it's a harder process, but effectively what you do is you turn the two council into, um, into your, the people who are assisting you in creating that decision. Mm -hmm. And um, so my, my thinking is on the training side, I would say that First of all, the process itself, how it's done, is incredibly efficient. The idea of not calling, I mean, in the United States, for example, they have interest arbitration. They have days and days of evidence. I mean, it's just, it, it's not the right focus at all. The focus is what do these parties need in a collective agreement? What would they come to? What agreement would they come to if they were behaving sensibly? You know, both mm. sides. Mm. And, um, that's why the outcomes so much mirror the, um, the actual outcomes on agreed uh, collective bargaining. So I don't think you need evidence. You don't need an elaborate process. You need to explain to the parties clear, to the, to the board, board of arbitration, what is at issue? Why is it important to us? Why do we need this? Who else has got it? 
What are the comparators? Mm. Who else has got this and why is it becoming a norm and why should it be in our agreement? How do we address this particular problem? How have others tried to address it in other agreements and so on? So those are the relevant things you put into a brief. But I mean, there are people who prepare briefs here who would be good, I think, to explain what they do and what they try. I mean, I've, I've got some briefs I could share with you uh, with their permission. But, well, um, but, but I think that's, it's really the, if you develop, you've got lots of arbitrators in South Africa, perfectly suitable, capable of doing this work, uh, people who are good at mediating. But the group that you're missing, I think, is the nominee group. The, uh, those who are actually on that side, they're for the union or for the management, and they are good in the process of coming to agreements. That's how that grouping of a neutral arbitrator with, the, with um, good input on each side is, um, is what's valuable. I mean, it's, it's very hard for an arbitrator if you get very rigid nominees who come on with a position who just, and they're just plugging the same thing all the time. It gives you no guidance at all, you know. Well, thank you. I think um, this is a topic that is of huge potential value and, and, and I would strongly suggest that we explore it further and possibly pull some, some of the people that you work with there into further um, webinar um, and, and explore this further, as I say. But for now, unfortunately, thank you, Chris, for unfortunately, yeah, our, our time is up for today or almost up. And so by way of closing up our discussions, I would first and foremost just like to obviously extend a very big thank you to Susan, to William, to Mohammed, and to Chris for joining us today and for sharing their vast experience in the various aspects of collective bargaining, both in South Africa and internationally. It's been valuable indeed, I think, to hear their viewpoints and receive their guidance on a way forward for our collective bargaining season in 2022. It certainly is clear from what we've heard today that there are ways to enhance the quality of collective bargaining and to prevent protracted industrial action and, and unfortunate lose-lose outcomes. Given that this year's bargaining season is already upon us, I just wanted to let you know of some of the ways in which we at Conflict Dynamics may be able to assist you um, to enhance the quality and outcomes of your bargaining process. Firstly, to briefly mention that we are offering two public workshops towards the end of May and early June. Uh, the first focusing on how to prepare effectively for your negotiations, and then the second focusing on how to participate effectively in the negotiations. The workshops are aimed as always at representatives of both labor and uh, management or employer, and each workshop will be one day in duration. So I really would invite you to have a look at our website, or please feel free to get in contact with us by email, by phone, um, in order to get more information if, you, if you're interested. And then secondly, to bear in mind that we do offer comprehensive in-house training to both union and management teams. We focus on the joint training approach wherever possible on uh, negotiation skills that are required in order to bargain effectively. And then lastly, um, Conflict Dynamics maintains an independent dispute resolution panel known as CD Direct. And we have a number of very, very highly experienced facilitators on the CD panel who have uh, specific uh, skills in facilitating collective bargaining processes, including for highly complex multi-party negotiations. So again, please do feel free to contact us if you'd like to know more about using a facilitator to assist you during your bargaining process. So again, to everyone who has joined us today, thank you so much for um, your time with us. We wish you well in your current or upcoming collective bargaining processes and um, please stay safe. Thank you everyone and goodbye.